A Good Cry by David Anderson. The plane was full, which meant there were 266 of us hustling to stake out a seat. People were clogging the aisles, trying to jam oversized bags into overhead bins. Flight attendants were doing their professional best to referee the general shoving match in English, Spanish and Italian. When everyone was belted in place and the captain apologised for the delay, a baby began to cry somewhere behind me, maybe ten rows back, and would not stop. After five minutes, the cry turned to a scream. People began looking at one another peevishly. One flight attendant came down the aisle with a bottle of water. Another came with cookies and makeshift toys. The scream turned to a heaving, rolling wail of desperation. I could see a bevy of flight attendants gathering helplessly until a young steward came down the aisle. I heard him speak fluent Spanish and in a moment he had assessed the crisis. In the crowded plane, the baby's parents had been split up. The father's assigned seat was in the back of the plane. The steward quickly worked a trade. The man sitting next to the mother and the child happily gave up his seat and reunited the family. Immediately, as if the power to an amplifier had suddenly been pulled, the baby's shrieking ceased. There was a moment of silence and then 264 passengers broke into spontaneous applause. We clapped for the end of the noise and for the heroic diplomacy of the steward. But we also clapped because it was moving to see a hysterical child calmed in an instant by the presence of the father. The sudden silence, however, was like a photographic negative suggesting its opposite. The desolate howls resounded in my head. It was raw, honest, persistent, effective. Here was a child crying inconsolably for security, raging against loss, against vulnerability, the close jarring and jawing of a hundred strangers. I can still hear that baby's cry. I have known I've heard it before, and not only from an infant. I have heard it in the ER, standing with a man whose wife had collapsed and been rushed to the hospital. As he received the news that his beloved was dead, he cried out in shock. I held him as he reeled and doubled over, heard the heaving cries that come up from the belly. And I've heard that cry when there was nothing left in the belly, no breath left to climb the throat. The woman who sat in my office with her husband the man who was up and leaving. He spoke calmly, rationally. She had wept herself to utter exhaustion and literally could not speak. Finally, her terror came out in a whisper, a death rattle more disturbing to me than the loudest ululation of the baby in the aeroplane. I kept hearing echoes of that child's cry because it was so clear. Babies, naturally, are very good at crying, and this tiny human with the oversized woofer seemed to give voice to all the fears and anxieties that bedevil us. Our world is too much like that jet packed with strange people, elbowing for space in the languages of Babel. Change, loss, separation, dark monsters, real and imagined. It would help if we could face these old fears and feel the catharsis of a good rant whether we were in the presence of anyone else or alone. But at our age, we are not good criers anymore. Some complain that we have become a society of crybabies. Maybe whiners and sulkers and gripers, but not real wailers. We are not gifted enough to let fly with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And are so far from my cry and from my words of my distress or to shock everyone from first class to the rear galley with the poetic howl of Dylan Thomas, who urged we not so gentle into the good night, but instead rage, rage against the dying of the light. No, it takes mighty, mighty cry to rich up anything so true and cold. The essential irony of spirituality is that we mature by becoming more childlike. This means, I think, that we can learn something from that crying baby. 
if we hear it and feel oddly, oddly, oddly envious of the raw honesty and energy of it all, we can start by acknowledging that. There are many adults who wish they could cry but have forgotten how. It's been so long. Then when someone dies or the house burns down, we are feeling an aching emptiness, as T.S. Eliot expressed it, dry, sterile thunder without rain. We speak clinically of processing our emotions, analysing our feelings and talking them through. But when deep emotions are stirred, there is catharsis and cleansing in the physical flow of tears and the momentary loss of control we so fear. Maturing as adults may just mean learning how to cry again. I have a friend who says that when he needs to cry, he listens to the right music alone in his car. Watching cry de coeur movies sometimes helps. A neighbour who lost her mother a few months ago was telling me she couldn't express her grief until someone suggested she write letters to her mother, as she always had. She had a good cry. Once upon a time, psychologists told us that all our emotional problems were caused by a failure to crawl in infancy. Remember that? If we skipped the crawling stage and went straight to walking, we had missed a crucial developmental period, and that would dog us throughout our whole lives. The answer was to get great big men and women on all fours, and they had to go back and learn how to crawl. I don't frankly believe in this bit of pop psychology. You don't need to crawl, but you do need to cry. There are moments in this crazy, cruel life when this is the only natural, healthy response. Children know instinctively how to do it, and the rest of us have to practice until we reclaim the gift for crying out loud.